All right, the first one. Measures are evaluated against the filter context, not necessarily against the visual context. And let me just kind of talk you through an example. So here I have a year and month coming from my calendar table and the max transaction value is a measure that is coming from my sales table. Now, if you take a look that in the month of Jan, the maximum transaction was 174, 130, 119, and so on and so forth. But at the total level, I ideally expect to add all the max transaction values and show the total right here. But here at the total level, what we have seen is that we would like to be able to calculate the total against all of this visual, but the calculation that is currently displayed, which is 174, is the context-based calculation, which is the context of year 2011, and it is giving you the max of 2011 transaction value. So I'm not really contesting that which one is the right answer. Is the max the right answer or the total the right answer? But you have to be very watchful, especially for the totals in Power BI, because they are going to be calculated as per the filter context and not really sum up the rows in the visual context. I've done a separate video on this to explain to you why does it happen and how to sort it out. But this is the first golden rule that you would want to keep in mind. Measures are evaluated against filter context and not necessarily the visual context. Golden rule number two, a measure is not the row of a table. Take a look at this Excel that I'm working with and I'd like to do a few things around Excel to help you explain what am I talking about. So in the sales table, I'm trying to calculate my total sales. You can see that I already have the units, but I don't have the price at which I sold the product. Obviously, I'll write a VLOOKUP. So I'm just going to say equals to VLOOKUP, VLOOKUP for the product ID. And I'm going to look it up in the products table. Uh, hopefully the name of the table is products, but I think it's called table number one, not products. So I look it up in table number one, which is the products table. And then I'm going to search for, let's say, the fourth column right here and last part is the zero part, which is the exact match, press enter, and that is where I get the price of the product. Now, obviously, I can multiply that price with the units, which is right here, and therefore, I get the total sales right here. Now, what we haven't realized is that we have written the VLOOKUP in every single row of the table. The VLOOKUP was here, that got the price, the VLOOKUP, the VLOOKUP, the VLOOKUP, so on and so forth. When we are writing calculations in Excel, we don't realize that our calculations by default due to the nature of Excel runs in every single row of the table. This is also the same when you're writing calculations in a table in Power BI. So I'm in Power BI and I want to write the same calculation in Power BI. I can just go ahead and make a new column, so new column right here. And I'm going to say, hey, this is my total sales. So I'm just going to call this as sales column. And I'm going to maybe first of all write a VLOOKUP. The equivalent of a VLOOKUP in Power BI is related. And I'm going to say, hey, related of the price in the products price column. And once I get the price, I multiply the price with the units. So sales table and units is the name of the column. Press enter. And that is the answer that I get. Now, the row by row calculation is the same concept when you're working in Excel. And it's also the same concept when you are working in Power BI, especially while creating a column in a table of Power BI. But let's just say that I'm trying to create the same thing as a measure and I do something like this. So I just go ahead on the sales table, right click and I say a new measure and I try to create, let's say total sales measure. And I'm going to write something like same thing. So I'm going to start to write equals to related. And as soon as I write the related uh, function, I'm going to try to fetch the price column. So I'm going to say products price. And it doesn't really give me suggestions of the products table and all the columns of that. And I'm not really able to forcefully write the price we look up right here. Now, the reason is that the measure that we have just created is not the row of the table. However, if you take a look at what we have done just a while ago, you would have noticed that I went to the sales table, I right click on the sales table and made a new measure and the measure came up right here. Just because the table is holding the measure doesn't make it a row of the table. To be able to get access of the row of any particular table, you have to use something called as iterators to step inside the table and then get access to that. Now, let me help you understand. So I'm just going to write this again. So I'm going to say total sales measure and I'm going to say something like, hey, first of all, I'd like to step inside of the sales table. So I'm going to use a function called sumx, which allows me to step inside of a table. So I'd like to step inside of the sales table and then within the sales table now, row by row by row, I'd like to get access to the price 
and multiply that with the units so related and now you can see the price is giving me suggestions just as the way i would have expected that and multiply that with the units of the sales table and that is nothing but my total sales calculation now remember in order for you to get access for a row in any table you have to use an iterator otherwise a measure by default is not going to give you access to the rows just because you right clicked on the table and created a measure does not make it as a row of the table rule number three no naked columns what do i mean by that take a look let's just say that i'm trying to create another measure so sales table right click new measure and in the measure i'm just going to write it as a test measure doesn't matter and i'm going to maybe reference the sales table and within the sales table, I'm going to maybe reference the units column of the sales table. If I now close the bracket and press enter, this is going to give me an error because at the moment, what I have done is I have referenced a column without any aggregation. That means I'm not really telling Power BI, what do I want to do with the column? Power BI would not automatically understand that you want to do a sum, a max, a main, whatever you want to do. So remember, no referencing naked columns while you're creating measures always surround your columns around an aggregator. So for instance, I wanna maybe sum the units column of the sales table. And now if I actually commit on this, this is going to work just fine. Rule number four, create explicit calculations and not the implicit calculations. What do I mean by that? Please take a look. Now, let's just say that I have dragged the channel column of my sales table, and that is right here. Against the channel, what I'd like to know is what is the average unit sold per day? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe go to the sales table, which is where I have a units column. And let me just drag that column in my pivot table right here. I so far have received the total units right here. And now I'd like to get average units sold per day. Now, at the first instance, what comes to my mind is that if I change the aggregation of the sum here to an average, this would be the right answer. Let's just take a look at that. So I'm going to drag the units over to the sales table once again. And in here, I'm going to start to change the aggregation of the column. So the first one is sum for sure. I'm just going to right click here. And instead of using the sum, I'm going to use the average calculation. And I believe this is nothing but the average units sold per day. But guess what? This is not the right answer. Now, if you take a look at the sales table that we have it here, in the sales table, you're going to see that the number of days that we have, so 2nd January is duplicated, 3rd January is duplicated, 6th January is also duplicated, so on and so forth. So we have duplicate dates. That means our sales table, one single row means one transaction and not one single day. So if we were just taking the sum of this column and we were averaging this, this column by default, what we have received as an average is not average units sold per day. What we have received is average units sold per transaction. However, what we want is average units sold per day. Now, the problem is that let's say, for example, even if I go ahead and I take my date column, so I just maybe cancel the average units calculation after I have identified the problem and I take the date right here, put that in the column right here. This is going to give me the earliest date, which I can obviously call this as count distinct. And this is the unique days. Now I'm stuck at a problem, which is where I cannot visually like Excel take this cell of the data divided by this distinct count to get an average. I would not be able to write visual calculations on the canvas so far in Power BI. So the point that I'm trying to make is that if you happen to drag columns of the data to create your visuals, you are creating implied or implicit calculations which are available by default in the menu options right here. However, what I'm asking you to do is create explicit calculations using the DAX formula language that is going to expand and give you more optionality to create more sophisticated calculations. Take a look. How do we make that? Right click and I'm just going to make a new measure. I'm going to call this as average units per day. And that is going to be, let's say, the sum of the units equals to. So sum uh, of the units column of the sales table. And that is going to be divided by the unique count or the distinct count of the dates in my sales table. Close the bracket and close the bracket, press enter. And this is nothing but the answer that I'm trying to seek 
right here. Now this calculation can be sliced and diced by any dimension possible and that is what makes explicit calculations more powerful as compared to implied calculations in Power BI. Rule number five, create measures over columns in Power BI. Now there are two reasons that I'd like to give to you to explain this particular concept. The first one is that when you create a column in Power BI, Power BI is not able to compress that column using the VertiPack engine on which the entire calculations are running. Now take a look, we have created created this particular column and this is a calculated column in Power BI and Power BI would not be able to apply compression on this column that we have created in the data model. The second reason that I would like to give you is that once you have frozen the calculation as a column, now let's just say that there are a million rows in this particular uh, table. There are not a million rows, but let's say if there were a million rows in this table, then the calculation is going to run for a million rows one by one by one and the calculation is frozen. Not necessarily you're going to use the sales column in every visual that you create on the canvas. Some visuals may have commission related uh, dashboarding or charting. Some visuals may have sales related charts or visuals and some visuals may have re refund related charts or visuals. So not every single visual is going to contain the use of this column that we have created, which is now frozen in time. It's going to be recalculated every single time the model gets refreshed and that is not really the optimized way to go about it. So when you're creating a model, try to prefer measures over calculated columns in most of the scenarios. Golden rule number six, and this is very, very important. In Power BI, you have to keep in mind that you're creating a scalar calculation or you're creating a table expression based calculation. What do I mean by that? Whenever you're trying to create a measure, the output of the measure should always be a single scalar value. A measure cannot return a table. So think about this. We have a visual right here. In this particular cell, whatever measure that we drag should give you one single output because a table can't really fit in here. However, you can aggregate the table. You can go through the rows of the table, perform complicated operations and things like that. But eventually, once the measure closes and you drag the measure in the visual, this should give you one scalar value. The same is true when you're trying to create a column. So if I just go back right here, whatever calculation that you happen to write as a column in every single row should again give you a scalar calculation. But this changes when you're trying to create a table. So for example, if I'm just going over to the table tools right here and making a new table, this is where I should be able to write expressions or calculations that do not return a scalar value. They should, however, return a table as an output. If this is not the case that you're trying to follow in your tax calculations, your measures are going to run into errors for sure. So remember, columns and measures, scalar values, table expressions, non-scalar or table values as an output. Rule number seven, watch the input and the output parameters of the formulas and the functions that you're writing. Since the time I've started to witness or observe these small things, it has been a game changer in understanding how any formula is working. So let's just say that we're trying to work with the sum function and you write as a measure equals to sum and you start the bracket. Notice what the formula asks you for. The formula is asking you that, hey, I would like to input a column of any table, a physical column of any table. If you provide in the formula anything other than a physical column, it's going to give you an error. So you have to watch out for what the formula is asking you for. And obviously the sum function is going to return you a single value as an output. Take a look at another example, for instance, a sum x function. So in the sum x function, there are two parameters. You write a measure and you say equals to sum x, you start the bracket and the first parameter of that function is asking you for or a table. Now that table could be a physical table that exists in the data model, or it could be a virtual table that you could probably create using any function. But the first input should always be a table because it's asking you for a table. If you give anything other than a table that the formula is not going to work in the second part of the sum X, it's asking you for an expression. That means what calculation do you want to go do row by row of that table? Now you can write as complicated calculation as you would want in the sum X function, but remember it should return you one single value in every single row of the table so that the calculation can eventually be summed up. And at the end of the day, when you kind of close sum X and you finish the formula, it should return you a single value 
output. And that's how the sumx function works. Take a look at another example, for instance. Now the top end function, for instance, the first part is what you would like in terms of number of top rows. So you provide top n value, like one row, two rows, three rows. And then after that, it asks you for a table expression. That means what table do you want from which you would like to extract the top rows. And this table can be a physical table, this can be a, like a virtual table, and then eventually you kind of write an expression through which you'd like to calculate the top rows, which is the logic of calculating top rows. And then finally, once you close the bracket and commit to the formula, the formula is not going to give you a single value output, the formula is going to give you a table output, right? So all that I'm trying to say is that watch while you're writing what has been asked for in the formula and then you deliver that in the formula or input that in the formula and watch what comes out of the formula. Once you have this understanding of what goes in the formula, what comes out of the formula, you would then start to write a whole lot better tax. All right, those were the seven rules that I believe that are going to help you tremendously while writing DAX. They have helped me tremendously and I hope they are going to do the same thing for you. Let me know which one did you find the best and which one do you still believe that I have not covered? Please put them down in the comments and I'll be glad to take a look at that. In the end, I'd like to give a big shout out about my DAX and my Power Query training courses in case you are a beginner and you'd like to start with the fundamentals of these technologies and learn the way it works, learn the behavior, and then try to solve more difficult, more harder problems, even of your own data. I'd highly recommend that you take a look at my courses. They're going to be super awesome. Thanks so much for sticking all around. And of course, I'm gonna catch you guys in the next one. Cheers and bye now.